Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. This is my first time to be in Australia, and it's even my first time to be in the southern hemisphere of the planet, so I'm really looking forward to looking out, hopefully on a clear, dark night, one of these nights while I'm here, and looking at the night sky. I hope all of you have done that many times because it's a, it's a privilege. This is a little uh, film made by the... the um, by a program of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And it was a, it's a little film series called Science, the Wide Angle. You can see it yourself online if you go to scienceforseminaries.org and look for Science, the Wide Angle. But these are little films about science and what's interesting and different, different types of science and why science is so compelling for humans, and so this is just a little trailer of this film series, and I thought you might, this is a little appetizer for our evening together. The instant that one realizes that you're having a genuinely new thought is in, essentially indescribable. I'm sure that this is something similar to what people describe as a muse, it seems unworldly. I had a little telescope I'd take up country and everybody in the village would come out and they'd look through the telescope and see the craters in the moon or the rings of Saturn. And they'd go ooh and ah, just like my family and friends back in Michigan do. And it finally hit me, this is what makes us human. This ability to look at the sky with wonder. I look through a microscope, I can't help but be struck with a sense of awe and wonder about what I'm looking at. And I can't help but reflect on the larger questions of life. The human spirit does uh, gain a lift from pure curiosity, trying to understand who we are and where we fit into the larger scheme of things. Because if we didn't have that sense of awe, if we didn't have that sense of curiosity, we wouldn't start down this road in the first place. It's hard to do world-class science. When you look into something, you almost always get a surprise, and then that surprise leads you into new pathways. Are there failures? Absolutely. When you don't have very firm grounds, you're really searching for a needle in a haystack. I collected a lot of hay before I found that needle. It sure is fun to play in this space and to make new discoveries and hopefully make contributions that move us forward. Science loves problems. Any fool can find the solution. <laughs> Takes a genius to find the question. We live in a world loaded with questions and puzzles. If you know how to look, you can begin to see connections on humans and other species and between humans, other species, and the planet itself. And when you see those connections, it's hard not to be in awe. Uh, that uh, kinship that human beings share with all other creatures on Earth is a very, very powerful thing and helps us to understand the continuities and to place into context our uniqueness. So we get into those philosophical questions of what is life? And within that context, what is it to be human? There's this incredible universe that surrounds the Earth for us to go and explore and that we as humans have to pick up that charge. And then it becomes the task of human societies, cultures, and religious communities and philosophers to dig deep and find out what, what that message is that's beyond just what science is telling us. So do you feel a sense of awe and wonder as we get started here, I hope? <laughs> uh, I like that, uh, that film, and I hope you did too. Okay. So this evening, I would like to contribute to this sense of awe and wonder by 
taking us, taking you on a little tour of the universe and what we're discovering about the universe all around us using different kinds of telescopes. So I'm here this evening um, in my own personal capacity, not representing any of these organizations that I work with, so I can share with you some of my own personal reflections on what we're discovering in the universe, and I want to hear from you too. So let's talk about a fruitful universe. The, the reason I use that term is that I think that our universe is bringing forth very interesting things. We're part of it. So let's, let's see what we're discovering here. First of all, we're getting magnificent images of the universe now with professional telescopes. It's a little uh, ironic because so many people live in cities today where the lights have drowned out the night sky, so we have a lot of light pollution, as we call it, and we also have this phenomenon of urbanization going on where so many people around the globe are moving to cities and living in cities, and so that sadly means that fewer and fewer people are having the experience of walking out at night and being awestruck by the night sky, and yet I think that's such a very basic part of, of being human that I'm saddened by, by this. On the other hand, the irony is that our telescopes are getting so good these days and the internet spreads things so, so well that we are able to share professional images like this from telescopes easily through the internet and people anywhere in the world who have access to the internet can see gorgeous images of the sky that they may not be able to see with their own eyes. So in that sense, it's a, it's a good time for astronomy at least. And we see beautiful images like this. In fact, we're almost so spoiled by being able to see them that we don't even realize what a privilege it is. But here's an example of an image of star formation. Um, these are pretty newly formed stars. And stars have formed out of this gas. So you see this beautiful uh, gaseous nebula around these young stars. Stars are simply collapsed balls of gas. We now know that stars are continuing to form uh, vigorously in various parts of the galaxy and other galaxies too. These uh, galaxies are filled with gas and dust and the turbulent motions of these gas and dust tend to um, keep things from collapsing. But if you get a little eddy of gas that can feel its own weight, it will collapse under its own gravitational pull. And if you have enough mass of this interstellar gas and dust collapsing into small enough uh, volume, you can get an enormous amount of pressure. The gravitational pull is enormous. And under those conditions, those unusual conditions of, of massive amounts of, of gas, mostly hydrogen, compressed into a very small volume, you get a, a reaction called fusion, where hydrogen atoms fuse. They produce helium. Um, and that reaction produces light. And so a photon, or, or many times over, photons of light are produced in the cores of these collapsed balls of gas. And when those light photons can get out, um, it's basically the birth of a star. So a star is simply a little fusion reactor going on. And in fact, those fusion reactions create uh, heavier things than helium as well. If you think of your chemistry, your periodic table, you know that as you move up from helium, you get to things like carbon and oxygen and iron. These things are all produced in stars. So light also is produced from stars and winds, and the most massive stars will send out winds that start blowing away the surrounding gas out of which the stars have formed. So many times you'll see regions with bright newly formed stars and remnants of gas around it that's being uh, blown away. But I also want us to just pause a moment and see just the beauty of, of pictures like this and be grateful that we have telescopes that can give us the eyes to see with sensitivity this kind of beauty in the universe. We as astronomers use different kinds of telescopes. So first I want to ask if anybody in here has actually ever looked through a telescope. So raise your hand if you've ever looked through a telescope. Yep. Good. Okay. Or been to a planetarium. Anybody been to a planetarium? Yes, good. All right, and most important at all, has anybody ever been out to a dark place where you could see lots and lots of stars? I hope so. 
that's the most important kind of astronomy. So that's your one takeaway I want you to, from today, I'm going to show you a lot of things from big fancy telescopes, but I want you to be able to go sometime and just see the night sky in a place where it's really dark. Astronomers use different kinds of telescopes to study the universe in detail, and we need different kinds of telescopes to give us different types of information. So I, I often refer to this as like a symphony orchestra where the conductor will call out uh, music from the violins and from the flutes and from the percussion and all the instruments and then use all that information together to give the full beauty of the piece of music. Likewise, astronomers typically use different types of telescopes to get different components of information that we need. So um, we have um, telescopes in space, we have telescopes on the ground, we have radio telescopes, we have visible light telescopes. And these telescopes are put often in kind of obscure places. So even though you may have a telescope in the city here in Sydney, maybe, do you have any telescopes in the city here? So you can see a few things um, with telescopes in the city, but um, why do you think we put telescopes usually in obscure places like mountaintops or deserts? Anybody brave enough to share with us your guess? Yeah. yeah. That's right. So our lovely atmosphere that, uh, that I'm very grateful for because it lets me breathe, right? <laughs> but it's not very good for astronomy. Uh, the atmosphere, um, light traveling through our atmosphere gets, gets uh, distorted and blurred a little bit by all the turbulence. We also have water vapor in the atmosphere, which um, adds a, a problematic effect. And there are some colors or wavelengths of light that can't even make it through the atmosphere. The, the atmosphere filters out that kind of light. So that is why telescopes are often put in obscure places. Radio telescopes are often put out in deserts away from habit, you know, uh, uh, populated regions and often in, in valleys surrounded by mountains to protect them from radio interference. And also, the water vapor can be problematic even for radio telescopes. Even on a clear night, water vapor is still in the atmosphere, and it still uh, can, uh, can really uh, create some noise in our observations. Tops of mountains. These telescopes are the Keck telescopes. They're on the top of a dormant volcano in Hawaii. We hope it's dormant. Um, it would be kind of interesting to see a telescope kind of, you know, propelled off the top of a volcano, but hopefully that won't happen. And so these telescopes, you can see the clouds behind and below them. They're, the reason you put telescopes on tops of mountains is to get them as high as possible and above as many clouds as possible. Or even better than that, put them way up high. So we have space telescopes like this one orbiting the Earth or even orbiting the Sun or beyond. So um, space telescopes are designed to get away from Earth's atmosphere and Earth's interference. We have quite a few space telescopes operating. This one is the probably the most famous one. Anybody know what that one is? The Hubble Space Telescope. Now, who knows how long the Hubble Space Telescope has been in orbit operating? Any guesses? That's a good guess. Um, 28 years. So the, the telescope was launched into space on the space shuttle 28 years ago. So quite a few people in this room are younger than the Hubble Space Telescope, and a few are older, <laughs> like me. Um, anyway, we use different kinds of telescopes to get different kinds of information. There are other space telescopes as well, such as the Chandra X-ray Observatory and the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is an infrared telescope. And this morning, some of us actually visited the um, Deep Space Tracking Network uh, outside of Canberra, and we noticed they were tracking uh, the Chandra X-ray Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope um, even while we were there. So, uh, so those telescopes are also working very well from space as well as others. 
Um, there's our, our uh, space telescope. It's about the size of, of a bus, a city bus, and it receives commands from the ground to tell it what to point at in space. There are science instruments. The light will come into the, the opening, the open aperture here, and go down the tube to a big mirror and then pounce off the mirror and back to a secondary mirror up toward the front and then bounce off that mirror through a hole in the primary mirror and, and reach the back where inside here there are science instruments like cameras and spectrograph. And you can also see these, uh, these panels here. These are solar panels that collect sunlight and recharge the batteries. So that's how the telescope keeps being powered. This particular telescope has been kept in good scientific condition because astronauts have visited it several times. So here's the space shuttle returning from the last mission where astronauts went up and uh, um, connected with the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit and the astronauts would come out of the space shuttle in their space suits, their pressurized suits, and open up the doors of the telescope, pull out old science instruments, replace them with new upgraded instruments or do repairs on some of the instruments there. So this uh, space telescope is now in better condition scientifically than it ever has been. So we're getting tremendously good scientific return from this telescope. One of the astronauts on the last servicing mission to this Hubble telescope, you see it in the background here, and this is the cockpit of the space shuttle. This astronaut took with him this replica of Galileo's telescope, right? So this is the, the replica of the telescope that Galileo used about 400 years ago to do the first recorded observations of space, basically, looking at objects in the sky and making recordings of what he saw. And here we are four centuries later after many, many improvements on the, the idea of, of optics and telescopes and even now being able to record observations electronically. And so we have the sophisticated telescopes like this space telescope. And yet we are appreciative of the beginnings of this technology. The astronaut who took this up said he tried it out and he said it was a terrible telescope, and he was surprised Galileo could see anything at all. Um, but uh, that's how this whole uh, telescope business got started. And so this, I think, is an example of how technology can be used for something very good. And, you know, I'm very grateful that engineers and people with technical skills have applied that to this type of investigation so that we can learn more about the universe, and that feeds not only our understanding of science, but it also encourages richer uh, activities in the arts, thinking about space from what we've learned with telescopes or, or even music or theology or philosophy. So um, this uh, technology has been a blessing to us all. So with our wonderful telescopes, we get sharp images like this or like this. This is the... Uh, core of a very dense cluster of stars, a globular cluster, and when you have a very good telescope, so or in a very good place, so in a you know high place or a draw high and dry, you get high angular resolution. That's the sharpness of the image. And so that means you can separate star from star. So you can see in this picture many, many stars if you were trying to look at this crowded region with a telescope from the ground looking through our atmosphere, the light would kind of get blurred together, so you would just see a lot of, of, of more uh, blurred light. But here we can differentiate star from star, and astronomers were, will actually study the individual stars here to see their compositions, their ages, whether there are multiple populations. You'll see here that there are different kinds of stars, right? Um, red stars, blue stars, yellowish stars, white stars. If our sun, which is a star, if our sun were in this dense cluster, it would be like one of these smaller whitish stars. Um, the different colors here are caused by different temperatures on the outside atm atmospheric layers of the star. So um, who knows what, what the hottest stars, what color they are. Somebody over here. 
Yell it out. Make a guess. Good. All right. See, you've, you've studied well. Many people suppose it would be the red ones, but the blue ones are actually the hottest ones. They're all hot, though. They're all stars. You wouldn't really want to touch any of them. It's hard to understand this in context, though. I mean, our sun is not in such a crowded region. We don't see this when we look out, even in a dark place, um, uh, with, our, with our naked eye. So let's try a different view. So this is the view of a region toward the center of our galaxy, not taken with a space telescope, but taken with a telescope on the ground that gives us a very wide field of view. So this gives us a lot more region to look at. You can see a lot of dust and gas around this crowded region, a lot of stars. It turns out that some of these stars are not just single stars, they're whole groups of stars. And so um, some of them are actually these, these tight globular clusters. And I'm going to see if this will work for us. We'll see if we can actually zoom in to one of these objects and then transition over to the Hubble Space Telescope image of that same object where you get much more detail um, than you can see from the, from the wide image here. So let's see, this is the constellation Centaurus and we're zooming into one of those objects. We now see that it's actually a cluster of stars, a globular cluster. We're going to transition over to the Hubble Space Telescope image that gives us all that high resolution, that high detail. All right. So does that help with the context there? Yes, I hope. Um, that is truly, uh, to me, pretty mind-boggling where we can actually see the context of a globular cluster. By the way, these little globular dense clusters or stars are some of the oldest stars in the entire galaxy. They're billions of years old. We use these globular clusters in other galaxies to gauge sometimes the age of the entire galaxy because these are the first stars that formed in these galaxies or, or even were collected together to form the galaxy. All right, so we're zooming in now and you can see the context of that beautiful cluster of stars in Omega Centauri. So I hope I'm convincing you that the universe is beautiful. All right, that's one take home message for the evening. Let's look at some more beauty here. So here's another region of the sky. This is the way it's supposed to look, right side up, but uh, you all may recognize this in a different orientation, but do you know what constellation this is? This is Orion, that's right. Um, Yes, I saw this last night looking out the car window as, as we were driving and it was really bizarre because you all see it in a very different orientation here. And I did my doctoral research on this region. I, I used radio telescopes which can see not these bright stars but actually what you can't see in the visible light image here is a lot of dark gas behind all of this where there are new stars continuing to form. So. There are different layers of this region that you can see when you use different kinds of telescopes. But this is an image taken from a telescope on the ground, which gives you a wide field of view. So you can see this whole region of Orion. You see this famous star, Rigel, here. Anybody know what this famous red star is? Betelgeuse, yes. Um, then you see in, in, in some legends, this would be the belt of Orion, this would be the sword of Orion, um, but it has different kinds of descriptions as well. I always thought it looked like a kite to me when I was growing up with the tail of the kite here. But you'll notice that when you look at these stars in Orion, even with your own telescope or um, small telescope, you can see some kind of fuzziness around these regions. We call that, they call these uh, nebulas or nebulous, anything that's kind of fuzzy, an astronomer will say the nebula. And this telescope has a little bit of, of a heightened red sensitivity, so it's noticing that this star with that special telescope capability shows a little bit of, of reddening here. But we'd like to see more detail of this nebulous material here, right there. And so we're going to zoom in. So um, the Hubble Space Telescope doesn't see this big field of view. It sees small fields of view, small areas, but in greater detail as we saw before. So when we look at this little reddish pink region here in more detail with Hubble, it looks like this. Okay. So this is the Orion Nebula. 
It's a beautiful, colorful uh, star forming region that the gas is lit up in these beautiful colors because big massive stars have already formed out of this gas. These little pockets of gas have collapsed into new stars. The light and the winds coming off of these massive stars, much bigger than our sun, um, are kind of blowing away the surrounding gas, but in the meantime, one of these massive stars is powerful enough that its radiation actually ionizes the gas. That means the, the photons of light hit the atoms of gas and temporarily separate the electrons from the nucleus of the atom. When these atoms recover, they release colorful light. So when we see colorful light, we say, oh, that's beautiful, but we also say, ah, oh, this is a signpost that star formation is active, that massive stars are forming and are ionizing the surrounding gas before it blows away. And again, this is just a tiny colorful region on top of a much bigger dark cloud that's not ionized that has protostars forming in it that we see with radio and infrared telescopes. A lot of times in these regions you see these pillar-like structures. These are carved out when massive stars, which form very fast, relatively speaking, um, start, they turn on and they send out winds and radiation and they start to blow away the, the leftover gas, but the denser clumps of gas can hang on the longest and the wakes behind them, the kind of shadows behind them are protected. So if off to the right here are some very massive stars the winds are carving out and blowing away material, but you get these pillar-like things left behind pointing back toward these massive stars. So pillars are a common sight. And lower mass stars take longer to form. So often you find lower mass stars still forming in these column-like structures. Here's another beautiful column-like structure. This is the um, the Horsehead Nebula. I really wish we could turn down the lights a little bit more because these are beautiful pictures. Um, but we'll do the best we can here. So this is the Horsehead Nebula. You can see um, a lot of uh, gas and dust and kind of ethereal... Um, the videographer... Yeah, oh, wonderful. That's, that's perfect. That's perfect. All right, so isn't that better there? Let's see. Actually, let's go back and see our beautiful stars again. There we go. There's, there's the beautiful stars. All right, let's go back now and look at the horse head again. Um, you can see a lot of the, the dust, the gas, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful kind of ethereal thing. Maybe it looks like a horse. To me, it looks like a dragon. Um, you can decide what you think it looks like. Some people think it looks like a tapeworm. Okay. <laughs> Older stars are beautiful too. Um, this is, uh, older stars become unstable when they start running out of that inner hydrogen that's creating the fusion process that emits light. So when that instability sets in, the stars start doing funny things. They start releasing their outer atmosphere, for example. So here's an older star that has released part of its outer atmosphere. You can't see the star itself buried in here, but you see this puff of gas that's been emitted. So this is called the bubble nebula from an older star. These clouds of gas and dust and stars are often held together in these large collections we call galaxies. Here's an example of a galaxy. It contains probably 200 billion stars, something like that, and a lot of gas and dust filling the volume of it. There's so many stars that the light just kind of blends together in the core here. And you see these, over time, these spiral arms full of stars and gas take shape. And if you look carefully here, you can actually see other galaxies in the background here and here. Um, I just kind of chose this galaxy at random out of a catalog of galaxy images, but I think it's particularly beautiful. And so did the astronomers who found it, obviously, because they were so moved by the beauty of this galaxy that they named it NGC 1309, you see. Um, catalogs of astronomy aren't very poetic, but... Uh. All right, so we've learned that the universe is beautiful, but I want you also to know that the universe is active. It's not stagnant, all right? So let's start with our solar system. 
This is our beautiful planet Jupiter. In this image, you can see the atmospheric bands. Jupiter is not like Earth at all. It's a very, very large gas giant planet. It's, it's uh, mostly gas, although you know there may be some solid core way down in the middle. There's a giant red spot here. This great red spot is known to be a storm. It is um, changing. We're watching this system over the years, over and over again, and seeing how this storm is shrinking and getting smaller and changing shape, and other little storms are cropping up. So things are active and dynamic on other planets. The weather cha changes. When we look with different kinds of, of telescope detectors, we can see different things. So this is what Jupiter looks like in visible light with a very good telescope. But if you look at Jupiter with, ultraviolet, with a camera that senses ultraviolet light, you can see something quite different. Ultraviolet light is more energetic than visible light. And uh, when we look at Jupiter with a telescope that sees visible light and also ultraviolet light, we see this popping up on the magnetic poles. These are the energetic regions of the auroras, basically the northern and southern lights of Jupiter. They're excited when charged particles interact with the magnetic fields around Jupiter. So um, we can watch this dance around. In fact, if you go to the, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, website and look for animations, you'll see this video of this thing dancing around over time as the magnetic field fluctuates. And there's actually a probe at Jupiter right now. The Juno probe is actually at Jupiter orbiting and, and measuring its magnetic field. So we can correlate what probes at the planet are measuring with what distant telescopes can see. What other activities going on? This is the core of that Orion Nebula that I showed you before. You see some of the very bright stars here, and one of them in particular is capable of ionizing and making this colorful uh, array around the core of this nebula. But what you may not notice is that there's some tiny, tiny objects distributed around here that are smaller stars trying to form, even in the midst of this kind of turbulent environment that's being impacted so much by the, the massive stars that have already formed. So let's look for a couple of these small, smaller stellar objects still trying to form out of this gas. There's a couple of them. Um, these are blown up so you can see them better, easier. And so these are two young stellar objects still trying to form fully, but they're hot enough that they're showing up. And you can see that they're surrounded by these dark regions. They're, they're like disks, and they can be in different orientations. This one's kind of face on, this one's kind of edge on. These disks were kind of a surprise when they were first seen. It's been almost 20 years, I guess, since they were first seen here. And they're about the diameter of our solar system, all right? So these disks, dusty disks are about the size of our solar system. And now we understand that nearly every star that's forming in our epoch of time forms with a disk of dusty, solid debris around it. Um, it actually starts as a more gas-dominated disk that's made of the same stuff that the star is forming out of. But this disk, the gas dissipates and leaves behind the small component of that gas that's dusty or, or then it becomes rocky, basically solid debris. And these are regions where planets are forming. All right, we now understand that planet formation goes hand in hand with star formation. And studying these disks is a hot topic in astronomy. So here's an example of another disk around an object called HL Tau. And this disk of hot dust was mapped here, not with a, an optical telescope, but with these radio telescopes in South America that sense wavelengths in the millimeter and submillimeter wavelength regimes. This is the ALMA observatory. So you can't see the star in the middle here in these wavelengths, but you can see the, the dusty disk around this young stellar object. And of course you see rings here. Rings are often indicative of something orbiting and creating, carving out ring-like structure, just like the moons of Saturn um, help to create the rings of Saturn. So it's, it's highly likely there are planets 
that are forming in this, in this disk and creating these rings, although that's still under study, so it's a hot topic. Planets are forming, we believe. And then if we go back again to the end states of stars, this is an active period as well. Here's another star losing its outer atmosphere as it ages, but this time this, this old star has some rotation and has some some material around it's it's uh, in a disk around it. The star is buried down in here someplace. So the the losing of its outer atmosphere is coming out in a kind of bipolar fashion. Now this looks like something to a lot of people. What do you think it looks like? Say that again. Yes. So some people say it looks like a bow tie, which is it does. Um, it is actually called the butterfly nebula. Um, I think it's really very pretty. But what you also should notice is that the, the stuff created in the star is being expelled, all right? It's being pumped out from the star into the interstellar medium, back into the surrounding gas clouds that, that fill the space between stars. So that fusion factory of the star inside that's created not, over, not only helium, but actually things like carbon, oxygen, and iron, is now being expelled into the surrounding gas. Here's a more dramatic example. This is the debris of a star that actually exploded. So the most massive stars, when they start running out of fuel, they become unstable enough to actually explode as a supernova. So this, this is the debris of a supernova explosion. The star exploded about a thousand years ago. There were sky watchers in China who saw this and recorded seeing the star brighten up in the sky and people watching the sky have been able to see the debris from this ever since, especially now with our good telescopes. So this image shows the supernova remnant. The different colors here are show up in the different filters of the telescope and they are emitted from the different kinds of elements forged in the, in the star and in the explosion. So what I want you to see here is not only the beauty of this crab nebula, as this is called, but also the fact that the star has created stuff that is now being injected back into the interstellar medium. These different colors represent um, or are being emitted by atoms like oxygen and carbon and nitrogen and silicon and these are things that are now going to get mixed in with the interstellar hydrogen gas and then subsequent generations of stars will be enriched by this material. So stars not only produce heavier elements but they disperse it into the interstellar medium and when you have generation after generation of stars you actually get a situation where the, the, the later generations of stars form with heavier material with these circumstellar disks that include heavier material that can make solids and planets. So these are, these are little factories. I call it stars are like God's factories, I, I call it, to uh, create these heavier elements um, in beautiful ways. All right, activity. We're still talking about activity. So all of this stuff I've been showing you is going on inside um, galaxies which are these collections of stars and gas. We can't really get all the way outside of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, to really take a picture of it like this, but we think it looks something like this. Here's an artist's conception of our Milky Way galaxy. There's so, much, so many stars in the middle that all the starlight's kind of blending together here. Our own solar system would be out here, our sun and the planets like Earth orbiting it would be out along uh, one of these spiral arms called the local arm or the Orion arm, but there are other arms in our spiral galaxy. And again, here in the southern hemisphere, you have a wonderful view of the Milky Way disk. So if you imagine looking, this is a kind of a flattened disk, but if you imagine looking out along the plane of that disk, all the starlight coming towards you is kind of get blended together and you just see kind of a swath of whitish light across the sky as you look across the disk of this in the sky. And that's what you see at the dark night here, I'm told. I can't wait to see it myself, all right? Um, we also have evidence that there's even something very mysterious in the core here called a supermassive black hole. Black holes are basically very, very condensed regions of high mass. And so if you have a massive old star that explodes but the core of it 
uh, has enough mass to just implode in on itself, you can get a black hole. And if you have a whole lot of those together, they can actually coalesce and form something called a supermassive black hole. You can't see these things because they're so, the gravitational field is so intense near a black hole that even light can't get out of it. But if you get far enough away, it's just basically a concentration of mass, so, so stuff can orbit it. And you can see material orbiting the center of our galaxy at very high rates of speed, and that indicates very high mass in the core correlating with a supermassive black hole. All right. I think I'm making the galaxy wobble by wobbling the table. Galaxies can actually coalesce together, so merging is a big part of our universe's history. These are two galaxies that are being drawn together by their mutual gravitational pull. Apparently this was common. When we look back in, 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 into the distant universe, we see um, lots of cases where galaxies are merging together, and uh, that's um, only possible when galaxies are close enough that their mutual gravitational pull dominates over the tendency of galaxies to be pulled apart. So the universe is expanding, space is stretching, galaxies are caught up in that space, and they tend to be moving away from each other. But if they're close enough to each other, the gravity will dominate. You'll get galaxies drawn together. And most galaxies like our own apparently are the product of multiple mergers over the long distant past. We can tell that by looking, finding different populations of stars within the same galaxy. Here's another pair of galaxies that are a little farther along in this merging process. They don't uh, typically have a lot of collisions between stars because there's still a lot of empty space in these galaxies between stars. But the mutual gravitational and tidal forces can totally distort their shapes and get rid of the, uh, the spiral structures. Eventually, these two objects will be fully merged into one bigger galaxy. And all that turbulence is inciting a lot of star formation which means you get a lot of these lit up nebulas, what I showed you before, but that's filling the whole space, lots of these bright hot spots where stars have formed and are ionizing the gas. So we call this a starburst. It's basically inciting a lot of star formation activity. Now, if you think this is just interesting but irrelevant to your life, um, it kind of is, but um, we measured very carefully a few years ago that our, our neighboring big spiral galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, is on a head-on collision course with our own Milky Way galaxy. So we will be experiencing a merger uh, between these two sister galaxies. Um, and the night sky, again, it looks like through the computer models that our solar system won't be disrupted too much, thankfully but the night sky will look a lot different in about three and a half billion years when this happens, okay? So um, keep, keep an eye out for this. All right. Weird things also happen in, in when you look at galaxies. So these yellow things are galaxies. They're just farther away, so you don't see a lot of as much detail as, as we saw in the previous image. This is a whole cluster of galaxies. Clusters of galaxies have a lot of mass. They're the most massive structures we know of in the universe. And most of the mass is not visible. These are galaxies you can see the starlight, but most of the mass in these clusters is something called dark matter. We know it's there. We see its gravitational effects, but we just can't see it. We don't know exactly what dark matter is, but it's not visible. Well, when you have a lot of mass, it distorts space, according to Einstein. Space-time can be distorted by mass, um, and in fact, any mass distorts space. You're di you are distorting space right now, but not very much. But when you have a whole lot of mass, you distort space enough that you can actually detect the changes. And one way you detect it is when light passing through this cluster gets distorted. It's passing through a distorted path. Light gets stretched out in funny shapes. It gets magnified. So this odd-looking thing here is just a normal spiral galaxy that's behind this cluster. But as the light's passing through the cluster to, toward our telescope, the light's getting stretched out into this funny, funny arc. 
and it's also magnified so you can see more detail of the background galaxy than you can of the galaxies in front. This is called gravitational lensing, all right? And it's not only a weird phenomenon that we see all over the place now in, when we look out into these clusters of galaxies, but we're also using it in astronomy to study things. So um, you can use the stretched out effect of, of these lens galaxies to measure and map out where the dark matter is in the foreground cluster that's causing that. So we can't see the dark matter, but we can map out where it is based on its effects. That tells us something about dark matter. We can use it also to see these distant galaxies in a great detail that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise if they weren't magnified by this effect. So here we can actually see and even measure the composition of this background galaxy that's very distant that we wouldn't be able to see at all if it weren't for the gravitational lensing effect. All right, so we've seen that the universe is beautiful. We've seen that it's active. Um, we're also seeing that it's enormous, all right, both in space and in time and also in the numbers of stars and galaxies um, that we see. So we, we know of galaxies, and for about a century now, we've known that there are other galaxies as well. My favorite image here is the ultra-deep field taken with the Hubble Space Telescope where the telescope was pointed in a direction of the sky where there aren't very many nearby stars to kind of drown out the image. And light was just collected for several days so you could see the faintest thing sh um, showing up in the picture. And this was the, the product. So this is an area of the sky that's about the size of a drinking straw, looking through the straw. These are not stars, all right? These, what's shown up in the image here are galaxies. Each one of these little blips of light could be an entire galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. If our Milky Way were in here, it would look like one of these spiral things, if we could get that far away to look back at it. There's a couple of foreground stars in our own galaxy. They show up um, with these optical effects here. But everything else is an entire galaxy. So just try to imagine this picture and extrapolate it over the whole sky. That's what our universe looks like. This is the universe we're in billions of stars in each one of these little blips of light, hundreds of billions of galaxies in the visible universe, and possibly planets around many of those stars. So, so it, it is mind-boggling, actually, to think about the universe. Um, we also have the case that there's another dimension here. There's the, the, the distance dimension. So some of these are closer to us, and some are farther away. All astronomy is a time machine, right? Everything we look out in space, it's taken time for the light to get to us. So um, some of these are more distant than others, and you can, uh, using uh, some careful techniques in astronomy, you can discern the distances of these various objects and kind of map that out. So this was kind of a mind-blowing image. It made the cover of newspapers. It made the Huffington Post feel reverent for a, a moment. Um, this is a graphic that kind of tells you what it means to be looking farther and farther in space and time. So as our telescopes over the last few decades or the instruments on them have become more sensitive, which is what this is kind of trying to show from top to bottom, we're able to see fainter and fainter things, like faint galaxies. So that's what these arrows are showing. That translates being, to being able to see farther out into space, to see fainter galaxies. So now we can see farther and farther out in space. Well, it's taken longer and longer for those distant galaxies, for their light to get to our telescope. So if we think of the time axis as going from right to left, we're seeing farther back and toward the beginning of the universe. All right, so. We think from various lines of evidence that our universe had a spectacular beginning, a burst of energy and inflation about 13.8 billion years ago. And so that would be kind of just off to the right side of this graphic here. And so from that 13.8 billion years of history, we're seeing now back to within that first 0.8 of the 13.8 billion years. So we're able to see these baby galaxies and stars just starting to form and coalesce and compare them with galaxies that are closer to us in space and time and see if they're different. And indeed, they are different. We can see that things have changed over this time scale of the history of the universe here. 
when we pull out galaxies from this deep field and arrange them according to their distances, we see that the most distant ones are small. They haven't had time to form that big spiral structure. They, they haven't merged much yet. As, as time goes on, a lot of these galaxies merge together, so they become bigger and bigger galaxies. They, they have time in their rotations to form these nice spiral structures. And interestingly, if you look at these with spectra, spectrographs, you can see that the compositions of, of these galaxies and their stars change because the first galaxies were, were made of stars, mostly made of hydrogen. But once you have generations of stars coming and going and producing those heavier things like carbon and oxygen, the galaxies like our own have still mostly hydrogen, but a lot of the other things too, the things we need to make planets, the things we need for life. So we can see how things have actually changed over time um, throughout the universe using our telescopes like a time machine. So what we can actually see is that the universe has developed over time. It continues to mature and change with the production of stars in galaxies and then stars producing these heavier elements, and then you know, later generations of stars being able to form with heavier elements in disks around them that can, that can allow planets to form. And these heavier elements and planets provide conditions needed for life to thrive, at least on one planet, right? Okay, so our planet is a wonderful place for life. It's thriving. We can see this whole development of the universe does that imply that the universe has a purpose, right? A purpose to bring forth life? I have just moved from science to something beyond science. Did you notice that? All right, not everybody notices that there's a difference between what our telescopes seem to be telling us and what we infer from that. And so lots of people can understand the science in the same way but come to a different philosophical conclusion about what we're seeing. And in fact, a lot of thought leaders were asked the question in a little project a few years ago where they were asked, does the universe have a purpose? And leading scientists, leading historians, uh, leading thought, uh, theologians were, were all asked this question. And they were asked to give a short answer and then write a little essay of why they had that answer. And do you think they all had the same answer? No. Um, does the universe have a purpose? Here's a sample of some of these thought leaders. Um, and of course, with each one of these short answers, they wrote a very interesting one-page essay. So if you're interested in this, I encourage you to go to the templeton.org website and look for this purpose project. But anyway, um, there were different answers. It depends on uh, who you asked. Um, this Professor Atkins at Oxford said, no, it's not even kind of a question you should be asking in this scientific age. Professor Gingrich of Harvard said, yes, he can't look at this progressive history of the universe and not conclude that there must be some purpose. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson said he's not sure. You know, if you read his essay, he says it depends on what you mean. Purpose for, for whom? Purpose for humans or purpose for the the bacteria in your gut or a purpose, you know, what, what, what do you mean by that? So he's not sure how to answer that. Jane Goodall says certainly, um, and, uh, and Professor John Hott from Georgetown says yes. And you can just see all of the, uh, the variety here. And the point here I'm telling you is that people can look at the same scientific data, have the same scientific conclusions about what the science is telling us, but have different inferences about the, perp the meaning, the philosophical meaning of that. This Freeman Dyson physicist said to him, it would not be surprising if it would turn out that the origin and destiny of the energy in the universe cannot be completely understood in isolation from the phenomena of life and consciousness, and that the design of the inanimate universe may not be as detached from the potentialities of life and intelligence as scientists of his century have tended to suppose. So in other words, perhaps, we are more of a part of this universe than we've ever actually made our, let ourselves think uh, fully before. Dennis Alexander was mentioned earlier in the announcements. He's coming out with a book. I'm not sure if it's out yet, but this book is called Is There Purpose in Biology? And he's looked at this question deeply, so I encourage you to watch out for this book when it's available and, uh, and read it. 
All right, so what about the perspective of faith? Um, we talked about kind of this philosophical question of purpose, but what about the perspective more specifically of faith? Here's some of my own uh, thoughts on this matter. So um, can science and religion both address truth? And how does a biblical view of the cosmos relate to a scientific view? I think very simply it's helpful to remember that science is very good at answering questions of physical cause and effect. How do things work physically in the universe and when, natural history and why in terms of physical cause and effect. That's a, a great uh, um, skill for our scientific method. But science is not very good as a tool for answering questions like why, capital W, why? Is there a purpose? Is there a God? How should I live my life? Um, these are questions that are better asked through our tools of, of faith um, and things like scripture and those kinds of things. And so I often find that there's a lot of issues in, in, in our culture even when people are using the wrong kind of tool to address the wrong kind of question that doesn't go with that tool. So, so just kind of making sure that we're asking the right questions of science and the right questions of faith and not trying to have science answer questions of ultimate purpose, nor asking our faith tools to answer questions of scientific detail. Um, but nevertheless, we're, we're pursuing in both realms truth, and I like what Sir John Polkinghorne said here. He's a physicist who became an Anglican priest. He was the president of Queen's College in Cambridge for years and now writes many books on how science and and uh, religion and faith and theology relate. And he said science and theology are both concerned with the search for truth. In consequence, they complement each other rather than contrast each other. He says, of course, the two disciplines focus on different dimensions of truth, but they share a common conviction that there is truth to be sought. And I think that's true, you know, science and, and, and Theology both believe that there's something, if we look and we search hard, there are, there are truths to be found, important truths, as opposed to some components of our modern culture which would say there is no such thing as, as truth. So in, in this sense, um, science and, and uh, theology are, are very close um, siblings. So we have some questions sometimes if we think about things through the eyes of faith. Could the universe tell us something about the nature of God? Well, I don't think that the universe, by looking at the universe with a telescope, you can prove God or disprove God or that kind of thing. I don't think science tools should be used in that way. But I do think if you are a person of faith, as I am, that looking through those eyes of faith and taking in what we're learning with our science instruments, you can have some resulting philosophical inferences. So these are not scientific conclusions that I'm about to tell you. These are philosophical inferences from a faith perspective that I glean from looking at the universe. You might glean something different, all right? So here's what I, you might glean from about the heavens reflecting the character of their creator, looking at it through a faith perspective, all right? I would glean that perhaps the creator seems to be powerful, right, from what we're seeing, and creative, this idea that stars themselves are the factories that create the heavier elements that we need for planets and life, that is a very amazingly creative process. A creator and a lover of beauty, the fact that we can recognize beauty and that there is beauty and we can recognize it, that connection. I mean, there, there are scientific ways of describing why our neurons and why our brains look at things and label it as beauty, but they're never quite fully satisfying. There's something about beauty that we, we know what it is, but we don't fully understand it, and yet we can connect with the beauty of the universe. How about patience? It looks like the universe is not infinite in time or space, or at least not in time. We don't know about the space part. Um, there may be other universes, but our universe seems to have had something spectacular happen about 13.8 billion years ago. And yet, this unfolding has taken time. Now, to God, 13.8 billion years is nothing, right, if you're outside of time. But still, it shows a kind of, of patience where not everything is, is instantly 
um, available, a faithfulness that fundamental laws don't change constantly and randomly so that we can have meaningful lives, cause and effect and so forth. Yet within these faithful fundamental laws, there's, there is a basic context of freedom. There's even in the basics of quantum mechanics, we see that there are some uncertainties and freedoms even in the basic physical structures of our, of our universe. It looks like the, the universe is, enables life. And so I would say that this might point to a, a, a creator who gives and enables life by enabling the universe to be fruitful for life. And that may, in fact, indicate love, enabling those of us who are having this, this conversation, sorry, you awake now, to, uh, to investigate, to be awake and alive, right? <laughs> and to appreciate the magnificent cosmos of which we are a part. So I do think that these are in indicators of the character of, of a creator, philosophically inferred. You may come up with a different list, all right? So a different list is okay, but, uh, but these are the kinds of things I think you might infer by looking at the heavens. There, I might do that again sometime at random and just wake everyone up. It's powerful, isn't it? What about specifically? Well, does the Bible say something about the natural world? Well, we can all pick out individual verses in Scripture and, and dwell on them, but let's just think about it as a whole. You know, the Bible is a collection of, of many, many books from different authors and different audiences, but together there's some general themes, I think, that God is responsible for the heavens and everything we find in nature, that nature gives glory to God, and that I think you can even infer from Scripture that God is pleased with discovery and with good stewardship of where we are. Sometimes there seem to be difficulties in, in trying to reconcile some particular um, teaching of Scripture with some particular finding of science. And I think in those cases it's helpful to remember this uh, two books model. I didn't invent this, but this is... A, um, a graphic of this idea from a good book called Origins by Harsma and Harsma. In this model, God is the author of both nature and scripture, from both of which give us aspects of truth. And there is no conflict in God's view of the relationship between nature and scripture. But the human enterprises of studying these things are done by humans who are not perfect and who are constantly thinking and refining things. So science is the human interpretation of nature and biblical interpretation is the human interpretation of scripture. And scripture itself is written down through human beings, uh, I believe inspired by, by God. But this human enterprise of science and biblical interpretation is constantly being refined there can be errors and changes, and there can be conflicts between our scientific understanding of nature and our, our understanding of scripture. And these things can influence, world, science influence worldviews and politics, biblical interpretation can influence theology and church traditions. So it's important to have conversations where there seems to be difficulty in reconciling things from science with reconciling things from scripture, but just remember that up at, in God's realm, there isn't a conflict. This is down here in, in our realm. And most often in scripture, we look at nature, in particular the heavens, they're mentioned in the context of praise um, for their creator. You know, science wasn't invented back when scripture was first recorded. It's one of the favorite psalms that we have is Psalm 19. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge, and yet they have no speech. They use no words, no sound is heard from them, and yet somehow their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. This is a beautiful passage. It's, it's very true, right? People around the globe are touched when they have a chance to glance at the heavens, and they feel that there's something that we can glean from the heavens um, even though the stars don't speak words to us. All right, it's all beautiful, but there are some difficult questions, and I don't want to gloss over that. So, example, what, what will the long-term future of the universe hold, for example? It looks like the universe is expanding. That expansion is accelerating. Will it just freeze out and die out? You know, I, I think, uh, you know, that's where you need to have a balance of, 
our scientific predictions with some of the other faith principles that we hold. Or what about this one? Do we feel insignificant when we look at the universe, when we look at these images of galaxies, when we realize that there are hundreds of billions of galaxies and hundreds of billions of stars in each one and our, our little Earth is just orbiting one such star? And, and what if there are other universes, you know, that our universe happens to be the one we're in and it has the physical forces that we need for, for stars to form and for life and so forth, but what if there are a whole bunch of other universes that, that don't happen to have that collection of forces um, are we even less significant? Um, famous astronomer Carl Sagan said, Who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet in a humdrum star, planet of a humdrum star, lost in a galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? Um, that's one way of looking at things, but it's not the only way. This is a philosophical choice. Um, and I kind of feel more like the psalmist here in Psalm 8, who is also having that feeling of insignificance. The psalmist wrote, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've established, here he's starting to feel insignificant. What are human beings that you're mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? But he goes on and he says, And yet you've made them, us, a little lower than God, and crowned them with glory and honor. You've given them dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under their feet. What does it mean to have dominion? Well, obviously, we, don't, we can't really touch and do stuff with our hands and other, other star systems and galaxies, at least not yet. I, I view this as understanding. We've been given the gift of being able to explore. I think science would be included in this gift our significance, according to the psalmist, is not from our position in space or our lifespans. It's because God has given us significance and that we have the ability to study the universe and contemplate our place in nature. And that, I think, is evidence of a kind of significance that we can be grateful for. And there are more tough questions, um, things about suffering, and natural disasters and things of that nature. I don't have time to address all that, and I certainly can't answer all those questions. But for Christians, the answer is all based in the incarnation, which is a fancy word of saying that the God of the cosmos actually entered and became flesh, says, says uh, the book of John, and dwelt among us. And it is in the person of Jesus Christ that we find a personal connection to God. And in fact, it is through him we're told in Scripture that the whole universe was created and upheld. He is our connection, a person, um, the person who is the source of all wisdom and all understanding and all life. So how do we respond to this amazing universe? All right, there are different things we can do. One of them is to... Uh, give praise and to feel a sense of humility and awe. I hope everyone in here, wherever you're coming from, I hope you feel a sense of awe. I think another response is to feel a sense of appreciation for our little planet that we live on in this vast universe and to care for it as good stewards and all of its inhabitants, other people and other creatures on the planet as well. And I also think exploration is a good, uh, is a good way to... Uh, respond with more curiosity, more appreciation, and more exploration. And indeed, there's a lot more to keep exploring. So I'm, I'm going to leave you tonight with just a few examples of interesting things that we still want to learn more about because the universe always holds new discoveries, new mysteries, new surprises, new questions. Something very exciting happened a couple of years ago when, for the first time ever, we detected something called gravitational waves. Anybody heard of this? So, you know, all these different kinds of telescopes I've told you about, they're all receiving different kinds of electromagnetic radiation, whether that's radio waves or visible light or infrared light. But Einstein said that if you had acceleration of mass, massive things in the universe, it would actually propel a wave of distortion of space-time itself. 
And yet this would be very difficult to detect. So people have worked for decades trying to figure out how to detect gravitational waves to see if they actually exist. And a couple of years ago, finally, these massive detectors on the ground detected gravitational waves, gravity waves, being emitted apparently according to the computer models from two black holes that merged together somewhere off in the universe and emitted these very interesting signals over time, these distortions of space. Tiny, tiny, tiny. This is an artist's conception of two black holes merging. And just last year, another um, gravitational wave signal was detected, but this time it was from two neutron stars, which are uh, dead stars, but when they collide and merge, they actually can incite an explosion called a kilonova, which you can see with other types of telescopes. So that was very exciting because you could then find out more specifically where this, ex where this gravitational wave was emitted from and which galaxy it was coming from. Very exciting. We want to learn more about it. We want to understand better what this dark matter is I told you about. We want to understand what dark energy is. It seems like something is accelerating the universe apart. We just call it dark energy. Closer to home, we'd really like to know if there's other planets like Earth and whether there's life beyond Earth. So um, I'll just uh, mention for the dark energy part this detection that the universe is not only expanding but getting faster in that expansion was made by uh, three scientists who won the Nobel Prize for this, including Adam. I'm sorry, uh, Brian Schmidt here, who is a resident of Australia, Canberra, although I went to graduate school with him, actually. Um, wish I'd gotten a Nobel Prize. Okay. Um, I'm going to just quickly mention that we're discovering lots and lots of planets outside our solar system now. Um, this is an example of a real system, uh, although this is an artist's conception because we can't get this much detail yet with our telescope. So we're discovering lots of other stars that have planets um, orbiting them. And so now the race is on to build new telescopes that can actually analyze the atmospheres of these exoplanets, which means planets outside our solar system, to see if any could be habitable for life. It's a very hot topic in astronomy now. We have not yet found life beyond Earth, but we're certainly intrigued by the, the, the realization now that most stars have planets, maybe all stars. I hope you've been inspired tonight. This is a beautiful star-forming region, another one called Westerland II, where you see the young stars having formed and these pillar-like things pointing back toward the stars, younger stars forming here. Beautiful gas, beautiful stars. Um, I gave a talk like this in Canada, and one of the women in the audience was an artist from Iran, and she thought the galaxies looked like cosmic dances. So she made this drawing. She was inspired to draw this cosmic dance um, Mashid Fatih is her name. Last year I was working at an observatory in the, in the United Kingdom and the, the young postdoctoral scientist in the office next door to me had an intriguing uh, postcard over his desk which came from his hometown of Ravenna in Italy. This mausoleum is about 1,600, 1,700 years old. I mean, it's really old. <coughs> and on the top of the mausoleum is this collection of stars. Anybody in the northern hemisphere would recognize this as the rotational apparent sky that you see when you look at the north star and over time as the earth rotates the stars appear to rotate around the north star. It's really the earth rotating. But instead of the north star and the ceiling of this mausoleum on this mosaic, the artist has put a cross there and the idea is that the navigators coming through this town were being reminded to navigate based on keeping Christ as the center point of the navigation of their lives. And so the scientist next door to me was, was being encouraged to do the same thing. He was given that picture by his peers back in Italy. He kept it over his desk to remind him uh, to keep, keep Christ as the navigating center of his life. This is my colleague Gladys. She's also an uh, astronomer. She analyzes data from telescopes, but when she takes her holiday time, she goes and visits um, places uh, as, as mission work, including this orphanage. In this orphanage, the children have uh, plenty of food and clothing, 
Um, but what they want to hear from Gladys is about space. Their spirits are lifted when she comes and tells them about what we're discovering in space. So I think space exploration can be inspiring to the human spirit. Um, even for people who can't necessarily see with their eyes what many of us can, this is a student at a school for visually impaired folks that I spoke to some time back in Maryland. We took images from astronomy and put different tactile coatings on them so that a galaxy feels different from a comet, that feels different from a star, it feels different from a planet. So people who can't see with their eyes these beautiful images can still feel the differences between what, what are in these images. And these students were just as excited and enamored by the beauty of what they were seeing through touch as what uh, the rest of us feel when we see with our eyes. As we close tonight, I just want to show you that there's a lot of resources if you're interested for the relationship of science and um, faith and philosophy and, how to, and ethics and how to piece all this together. These are some examples, so I'll put this up at the end too if you want to take a picture of this. But some great books, The Language of God by Francis Collins, who's a geneticist, but he has a lot of interesting science in his book and, and his own testimony of how he came to faith as an adult scientist. The Book of the Cosmos is a wonderful collection of literature, just small samples of writings from throughout human history about the universe and, and inspiration that comes from it. Um, the ISCAST organization that's sponsoring this lecture tonight, and I'm sure there are other organizations that I'm missing here. Christians in Science is based in the United Kingdom, but there's a lot of uh, interesting resources there. There's a new CIS group forming in New Zealand as well. The American Scientific Affiliation is a network of Christians in Science in the U.S., and there's a lot of resources on the ASA website, asa3.org. This organization, biologos.org, is really designed for Christians who are desiring to see harmony between science and biblical faith. They have wonderful resources on the website, so look up Biologos. The Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion is an e effort of a, a scientific society. This is not a religious organization, but an effort to help scientists and religious communities have better communication. So there's good resources on this website, including the film series that I showed at the beginning. The Faraday Institute for Science and Religion in the UK has wonderful seminars throughout the year, and they put their resources on the internet. So uh, there are wonderful videos and, and talks you can get there. And there's a great booklet you can get on the internet um, with different chapters written by different uh, scientists or, or uh, pastors or, or um, theologians called When God and Science Meet. And you can get this booklet for free as a PDF on this website, nae.net. I recommend it for personal or group discussion. My last slide. I gave this talk to a group of medical doctors, um, women in medicine and dentistry, a talk like this. And one of the doctors was so inspired by the pictures that she saw, Dr. Powell, that she went back at this conference to her hotel room and wrote this paraphrase of a well-known psalm and came back and showed it to me and I was very impressed so I asked her if I could show it to other people and she said yes. So this is The Lord is My Galaxy Maker by Dr. Clydette Powell. She took the, this as, uh, she was inspired to write this based on the 23rd Psalm. So some of you may be familiar with this psalm, this biblical psalm that goes like this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, um, and so on and so forth. Well, she has re, rewritten the psalm in terms of looking at the heavens. So she wrote, The Lord is my galaxy maker. I shall not want for praise. He makes me lie down in green pastures and upwards look. He leads my gaze to behold his heavenly glory, and thereby he restores my soul. He leads me in colored paths of awe and wonder for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for he is with me. His nebulae and star clusters and even their interstellar gas comfort me with assurance of his power and majesty. He prepares a tapestry of stars before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my mind with the joy of speechless discovery. My eyes overflow with tears. 
Surely hallelujahs and praise shall fill all the days of my life, and I will dwell in his celestial house forever. Amen? All right. We live in an incredible, inspiring, and fruitful universe, and thank you very much for your patient attention this evening. Yes.